Okay. Uh, well, my name is John Coddington, and uh, I'm a senior scientist at the Smithsonian. I realized I didn't put my name on the uh, title slide. But uh, I also run a program here called the Global Genome Initiative, uh, which um, is what mostly what I'll be talking about today. So the title is Not Too Much Life, and that's to give everyone the uh, impression that what I'm going to talk about is actually feasible. There are two aspects to this program, um, and they're on the screen here, understanding and preserving the genomic diversity of life. And by life, we mean everything from archaea and bacteria all the way through uh, eukaryotes. And the reason it's called the Global Genome Initiative is because from a phylogenetic point of view, uh, given that life only originated once, there actually is only one genome, although it has ramified and diversified in many ways. But uh, certainly all of you are familiar with the, the orthologs and the, the amazing ways that much of the genomes of life are actually similar to each other rather than you know, totally different. Um, so here's the outline. First, I'll just introduce this program and, and give a bit of an overview about GGI, then, um, and we'll go through these uh, as uh, we move from one section off to the next. So what are the goals of the Global Genome Initiative? This before column uh, explains more or less uh, where we are now. Um, certainly a rate-limiting step for doing genomes is access to high-quality tissue. Tissue is now hard to find. You have to know who has it. Uh, the quality of the tissue is often ambiguous, and um, it's also ambiguously owned because let's remember that in 2014, the third leg of the Convention on Diversity was enacted called the Nagoya Protocol, which is access and benefit sharing to um, genetic resources. Um, so after, what, we want to, what we're trying to accomplish is to move those tissues into publicly accessible uh, enterprise biorepositories that are maintained institutionally following best practices and international treaties like the Nagoya Protocol. I'd say at the moment we're still at the stage where we do sort of boutique sequencing of a few model genomes, um, and obviously that's accelerating rapidly as I'll describe, but uh, we would like to encourage efforts to sequence across a thoughtful phylogenetic synopsis of all of life, sort of illuminating dark taxa uh, across the entire tree. And as one uh, example of an applied aspect of this, uh, Knowing what species are is usually a, a function of having a taxonomist who's highly trained in morphology to do that. So it's a phenotype-based expert limited taxonomy, and uh, that's important in environmental biology, evolution, conservation, ecology, and biotech. Uh, one of the short-term payoffs of genomic data about the tree of life would be that uh, identification would become scalable and you wouldn't need particular taxonomic training, so precise, scalable, and cheap tools. Um, this is a slide you've all seen uh, just to say that uh, genomics or doing genomes is getting cheaper. The inset shows you up through about 2013 um, how many eukaryotic, pro prokaryotic, and virus genomes have been done. I'll have a more modern slide later on. Um, here's another aspect. This has to do just with barcoding, which I assume you all know is either usually a cytochrome oxidase 1 in animals, MATK, uh, RBCL in plants. And as you see from over the last, say, 20 years, uh, that uh, the number of tax in GenBank with barcodes that had a name on them, a taxonomic name, has gone from, say, 80% down to 25%. So we're actually sequencing, um, just in, in the sense of barcoding, taxa faster than anybody can name them. So dark tax are outpacing names. The taxonomists, as we all know, are dwindling. I, by the way, am a spider taxonomist. And so practical um, approximate IDs are urgently needed. So to summarize this, this program, then, it's a six-year program, philanthropically funded. Um, and we would like to get uh, all the families of life on Earth and maybe half of the genera, that is to say, um, good quality tissues in biorepositories around the world. Um, a number of payoffs from that, obviously, research, uh, partnerships, the IDs I already described, um, building global biorepositories, um, genome samples. 
So uh, that's the GGI overview. Now, how big is life? I mean, how big a problem is this? Uh, this is the graph you usually see, uh, which is showing essentially that uh, species are, there are many species. There are about 1.9 million described. Nobody knows how many are still out there. And as you can see for a group like spiders, um, this is, um, it's still going up at a sort of um, logarithmic or very fast rate. On the other hand, something like birds, um, there are about 10,000 species of birds. And I should explain that what this graph is showing you is from the time of Linnaeus, say 1750, there, there are about on through 2010, the last I updated it. This is, represents the first time someone found an organism belonging to one of these clay. So you sort of go out in the woods and you pick something up and you say, wow, that's a new species. So it's measuring the discovery of biodiversity by science um, actually in the field. It doesn't have to do with, with changes in classification. On the other hand, if you look at families, families being um, you know, clades of organisms that have the Linnaean rank of family, you can see that it's almost everything is asymptotic. So uh, only the bacteria and archaea are going up the way spiders at the species level went, which means that by and large it's very rare to find um, a new family of spiders, or sorry, of any organism. For example, uh, oh, here's just a, a diagram showing you how um, life as a whole is organized. There are three domains, obviously, archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes, on down to the various taxonomic ranks. You see there are, about, there are only about 10,000 families of life on Earth, 96, 42, depends on who you ask. Nobody knows how many genera there are, about 200,000. And we can, um, in terms of a phylogenetic strategy to sequence uh, the global genome, we can sample at coarse, medium, or fine um, levels of, of, um, of fineness. So this is the, the slide of um, when the last time uh, families of familiar groups were discovered. You can see over here is uh, in uh, flowering plants, Gomorta gacii, 1972 was the last time someone went out in the woods, found a plant, and said, you know, this is a new family. Um, in birds over here on the upper right, uh, 1903. Um, mammals down on the lower left, 1974. Um, this is a fish, Potangulidae. Actually, that's, there was just a new family of fish found a few months ago. But in a group like spiders, 2012. So the, the point of this slide is to say that at the level of families, uh, biodiversity science pretty much knows um, how many families there are of life on Earth. It's rare to find a new one. So we're sort of done at the family level. We know what we're doing. Um, that's how big life is. Now, uh, how hard will it be to actually obtain samples like this? Um, this shows you, um, everyone should be looking at a slide called the Morea Biocode. Morea is a little island just off um, the uh, Tahiti down here. And um, this is just some the partner institutions who are doing this. The Smithsonian and a couple of other places decided they would collect every species of uh, organism on Morea. And then it was especially a marine project in the uh, ocean around Morea. And the point here is that of marine phyla, 74% were collected at Morea, 61% of families down to 23% of, or 23 percent of the families, so that uh, you can see that at a family level, at a deep clade level, uh, biogeography is sort of on your side. They're widely distributed, and you can get a lot of them, even in a place that is as relatively depopulated. Here's another example of that. This is uh, something the Smithsonian runs, which are 50 hectare plots in which every single tree bigger than the diameter of a human thumb is numbered and georeferenced and identified. And uh, there are many more plots now. There's almost 60. But these are trees. So there are about 10,000 uh, species of trees and about 4,300 genera, so 60% of the world total of, say, genera of trees, we know where they are, and we can go out and pick them up. So um, I'll, what I'm trying to convince you is that um, sampling the tree of life is not as, uh, as daunting as it may appear. 
To give you a final example, here's just ants. There are about uh, 300 worldwide genera of ants, and NSF funded a, uh, a project to do the Tree of Life on ants. And five people in five years were able to get 240, or 82 percent of all the genera of ants, uh, with DNA extractions. So um, it's feasible. Um, Another thing that this speaks to the issue of barcodes, which if you do collect a tissue, and it costs a fair amount of money to do that, for $8 you can barcode it. This is just an example of a project that we did on European spiders. There are about, we took a total of 821 species with barcodes, and we blasted those barcodes against themselves. What we wanted to know was if I have an unknown and I blast it against a database that uh, contains all the fauna, how many times is it right? And it turns out that an unknown in Europe, this is, is about 91% of the time an unknown from this database blasted against it would get the correct family and about 85% at the correct genus level, which suggests that if we did have uh, barcode sequences for all families of life on Earth, that uh, most any organism anywhere on Earth might be correctly identified to the family level using something like barcodes. So it's just sort of the ID radius of the barcode, in other words. Um, biorepositories, this is the Smithsonian biorepository, which came online in about 2012. Um, it's 24 liquid nitrogen tanks, about 58 freezers, and um, it has about 4 to 5 million tube capacity for 2 mil tubes. So uh, knowing that there's only 1.9 million species on Earth, um, this repository alone has enough to hold samples of most of that. Um, and other institutions around the world are, are also building biorepositories like this. So uh, one of the things, of course, that's important about genomics is getting high molecular weight DNA. Everyone says, show me your gel. So this is one of our gels showing a high molecular weight that doesn't go very far down. This is an agarose gel. We did invent um, a way to use agarose gels to assess the quality of DNA. And across the top, you see uh, a series of, of uh, gels. This is bad DNA, highly fragmented. This is pretty good DNA. Number seven, for example, down here, if you look at number seven on the table, um, is fairly high quality DNA. And what we did was we used ImageJ to figure out the density of um, pixels of DNA using a marker over here. Um, and we're basically saying that um, using this technique, if you have a, a gel with a marker on the side, you can figure out what percentage of the DNA is above, say, uh, 9 kb. And uh, as you see here, this high quality one, number 7, where's my cursor? Uh, my is 68% of it's above that concentration. So um, it's tough, in other words, to figure out the quality of DNA um, at a cost-effective manner if you're running a, an institution like the Smithsonian. But um, gel, you know, pulse gel electrophoresis is, is another way of doing it, but it's very expensive. So what we've also done is to organize um, biorepositories around the world. And um, this is something we started called the Global Genome Biodiversity Network, that's GGBN up here. 68 members to date in 22 countries, um, currently having about 600,000 uh, genetic resource samples from about a third of the families of life on Earth and about, um, I don't know, 15 percent of the genera. Now, um, these, the way we did this is by uh, inventing a controlled vocabulary to describe DNA and tissues. That's the most important contribution uh, that GGBN has made to the world. And what it enables all these institutions to do is to database their DNA and their tissues, which has never been done before, in a way so they can communicate amongst themselves and you can actually find out where tissues are and uh, who has them. So these are the logos of all the participating institutions. So how has that global effort been growing? Uh, this is the membership since 2011. So you can see it's gone up to 68 in, uh, as of 2017. Most of these institutions, though, don't have their DNA collections properly databased. So there's only 18 of those 68 who are actually pushing data to this portal and contributing to the uh, 
something like 600,000 samples um, that are currently online. But that is about a 160% increase since in about the past year. So um, it's generating a lot of interest around the world uh, to database and uh, sort of collectively be able to reason across uh, genomic tissue samples. So how are we doing on a taxonomic level? This is an example of um, all where those 2,000 um, families are. I think this might actually be, no, maybe not. Anyway, um, there's about 848 still left to go in Washington. We have about 1,600. Um, all the other institutions are contributing about 2,000. So, um, and at the generic level, uh, this is about the way it looks. So. Uh, there's more to go, about 4,000 more genera still at the Smithsonian that we want to get databased and online. And um, now I'm going to turn to talking about some of the genomics and uh, sort of I5K kind of issues. Uh, this is a, uh, a graph of the eukaryotic genome quality. There's about 4,500 uh, genomes on GenBank as of about a month ago. And what we have here is this is um, this is KB of the contig in fish. This is going to be a little hard to explain, but it's the, this is the KB, 1 KB all the way up through uh, 10 to the 4th KB contig in 50s and then scaffold similarly. So this is a sort of a, a 4 and a 5 joined, which I just used a period. It's not 4.5, but it's a, a KB to the fifth on the scaffold N50 and contig N50. So it's a measure of the, the quality of genomes. And as you can see, uh, very few genomes are up at this uh, high, end of the, high end of the spectrum. Uh, um, however, this is the increase in genomes of any sort for families since 1998. You can see that we're up to about 700 families have some sort of genome. Um, and now to turn to some of the I5K issues, um, these, are, uh, these are just photographs of the organisms that were in the I5K uh, 30 genome um, project that was mostly done at Baylor by uh, Fringy Richards and a host of colleagues. Uh, I was involved in doing some of the uh, spiders. And uh, how are we doing on tissues for I5K, which I assume the target of I5K could be also rendered as terrestrial arthropods, so arachnids, myriapods, insects, um, no crustaceans. And as you can see here, these are sort of Venn diagrams. The red shows you um, what is in GenBank. Uh, that's even as barcodes. Do we have any genetic information on it at all? Blue is the Global Genome Biodiversity Network, which I've been describing. That's um, do we have tissues of it? And yellow is just because I work here. This is sort of our way that we measure how well we're doing and what we have left to contribute. And green is the Catalog of Life, which is a database of taxonomic names that is broadly used. So. For example, if we look at families for terrestrial arthropods, we see that there's the, that's the 1302 number. That means there's 1,300 families of terrestrial arthropods that we know about that are not present in any of these three databases over here. Um, you can see that there are 185 plus 73 plus 45 plus 14 in GGBN, so we have tissues. Uh, the uh, Smithsonian has about 81 that are still sort of in our database but not entered into anybody else's database. And this is a very small number in, in red that actually has some genomic information. And when you get down to the level of genera, you see that um, there's a lot left to do. There's 81,000 genera of terrestrial arthropods that are still out there, not present in any of these databases. Whereas for orders and classes, the situation looks a lot better. So um, this is uh, progress in terrestrial arthropod genomics, um, which uh, we just figured out and um, graphed these things for you. So you can see that there's essentially three levels of um, genome quality in GenBank. There's things that only have contigs. There's things at the level of scaffolds. There's things at the level of chromosomes. And then there's uh, one which is a complete genome, which is really 
extraordinarily rare. And you can see that um, as we go along on this graph, um, other animal chromosome or terrestrial arthropod chromosomes, these are the highest quality chromosome level assemblies. Uh, there's still a relatively small fraction of contributed genomes. Most are at the scaffold level, and um, when you look at, say, what had been done up to 2010, uh, these are other animals and then terrestrial arthropods in red. And then uh, when you look at 2011 through 2017, there's a, a very great density of new genomes that have been contributed. But the arthropods are, uh, this is again the same sort of thing. This is Contig in 50 in terms of kilobases. So uh, good is over here. Uh, that, I think, is Edie's aegypti, actually, that one that's really high quality. But you can see that we're not, although we're adding a lot of genomes, we're not adding a lot of high quality genomes. So um, this is just some early data from the I5K project, which is focusing on some of the arachnids that I've been working on. And what I want to call your attention to is the common house spider and the bark scorpion, with gene numbers being sort of substantially above um, any of the other gene models you'd see for some of the other uh, insects and other terrestrial arthropods that were part of the I5K. And it turned out that um, that we, I'm talking here now just about the common house spider, this thing up here. Um, we we used the, the pipeline, basically Illumina high seq sequencing at Baylor. Uh, we only got a contig in 50, about 9 kb, which is not very good. So then we started using and uh, trying a new technology, dovetail genomics, which is um, do I have a, yeah, I should start at this one first. Um, it's a, a pipeline they say called Chicago, which is physically mapping data. It involves complexing the DNA to chromatin, and basically produces really long range um, libraries that span all distances up to the fragment size. So. Um, we gave them DNA that the maximum fragment size is about 150 kb. And you can see here that the, uh, it went, for example, from 816 scaffolds to 94 scaffolds, uh, which is pretty good. 94 scaffolds for a genome is not bad. Um, and then 90 was, you know, of course, a little bit worse than that, but uh, about a 1.5 gig genome. So um, this just shows you what the the improvement in the uh, contig um, or scaffold was when the blue line is after dovetail genomics, the red one is before dovetail genomics. So it it was able to uh, both use the Illumina data, which it, it basically used the long, the long um, libraries to better scaffold the Illumina data is what it does. So it made a big improvement. Now, the main thing about this, uh, as we published earlier in the year, is that we feel that there's substantial evidence for a whole genome duplication event in the common ancestor of uh, spiders and uh, scorpions, in fact. And this is just one illustration from that, uh, that paper. These are the, the various scaffolds showing extreme you know, duplication between various and sundry of uh, the named scaffolds we're using for Parasteatota. So uh, probably the reason that there are so many um, more genome or gene models in Parasteatota is because of a whole genome duplication event. Some of those genes have been repurposed for other purposes. Others are sort of pseudogenes, but it makes spider genomics kind of tough to do. Now, a genome that was just published a couple of months ago was uh, Nephila, which is a spider in which they were particularly interested in silk genes. Um, Anephiloclavipes, and here I found some of these stats to be interesting. If you look down here, the number of scaffolds, they're still working at a fairly uh, large number of scaffolds, about 1.8 million scaffolds, uh, pretty low contig in 50 size. So although the genome wasn't uh, particularly high quality in according to either of those two metrics, um, it did have, it did focus on trying to get uh, complete sequences on these silk genes. Silk genes <coughs> are called 
fibroins, and they are beta pleated sheets of silk. They're uh, almost crystalline sometimes. That's what makes them tough. And if they have a lot of side chains, then they're not so crystalline. That makes them flexible. So spider silk is the toughest natural fiber known, far stronger than steel, stronger than Kevlar, you know, um, et cetera. And these are the various kinds of genes they found. We were surprised here. Spiders are supposed to have about seven kinds of silk, and they found 28 different kinds of uh, silk. And these are sort of the uh, a little cartoon of the way these things are organized. And just if we go down here to look at the aggregate silk, these AG ones, those are the, the silks that they use to make glues out of. And you can see these NNN here. Just, these are highly repetitive uh, things. Over 400 motifs, which are probably 20 amino acids long that are repeated constantly across within these uh, silk proteins. And uh, so about 400 of those combining to make about 28 different kinds of silk. So uh, it blew all our acnologists' minds that they would be this many kinds of uh, silk proteins in uh, a single species of spider. Uh, and I guess that's it. Thank you. So it went a little faster than I thought. No problem. Right. Well, thank you. So um, again, if, if anybody would like to ask a question, we'll go ahead and leave the mics open. And you're welcome to ask your question directly. Or you can always send those questions directly to me, Anna, either through the uh, the AT&T Connect um, interface by clicking on my name, or you can email me your questions. So uh, I'll leave the mic open here for just a second. Does anybody have a question to start us off? Hey, yeah, this is Monica Polsha. Hi, John. Thanks for the, the talk. That was really great. Um, I uh -huh. have just a question out of curiosity. You had that slide where you showed um, the number of um, classes, et cetera, that um, were or were not um, in uh, one of those three databases. Um, so in, in the classes one, you said this that one? there were two. Sorry, it's uh, your slide has, has a lot of delays on my end, so sure. <laughs> I'm not sure, but the, oh, yeah, get there. Um, so there are two classes that are not in those three um, databases, so two out of, um, I guess, seven total. So what are those? Yeah. Um, I think they're poropods and um, Maybe some phylons, which are there's four classes of things: chylopods, uh, diplopods, poropods, and some phylons. I think those are the two that nobody's got. Um, okay. Tiny little myriapod, you know, multi-segmented, multi-legged critters. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that blew my mind that out of just that many classes, yeah, I know. those two still it's, have them. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a question. You mentioned that you all are uh, collecting all the kingdoms of, or all, all life. So does that include viruses? Yeah, well, the, we're not trying to, um, the Global Genome Initiative is certainly not trying to duplicate what anyone else is doing. So as everyone knows, there's, I mean, the short answer is yes. Uh, we track data on viruses. Um, the longer answer is that there are plenty of research communities devoted to archaea, bacteria, and viruses. Uh, so, and they're also very simple to sequence. Um, so we're not, the Smithsonian is not trying to do that. We, we do, uh, our, my museum does have a lot, you know, spans most of the eukaryotes, although we don't do fungi. USDA does fungi, not us. Um, but um, so collectively so around the repository? Well, the viruses are a different kind of community. They're usually the cell culture folks, okay. like the ATCC. And, uh, but we, GGBN is the data model we use for databasing tissues and uh, DNAs and RNAs and all that stuff is applicable to viruses, of course. So it's, we spend a fair amount of time reaching out to communities like that. Um, to get their data online as well. So in terms of the portal, which is the GGBN data portal, which is in Berlin, you can, you can you know, Google GGBN and see what's going on. Um, we do include um, any biorepository that specializes in viruses or anything else. Great. 
Uh, I've got another question here. How are you all handling identification and labeling of cryptic species? Well, uh, we're using classical taxonomy to do that. So um, we have, you know, the genomics era has been what, since about the 70s, right? And um, many people around the world have been collecting DNA samples since then, and many of them were, you know, precise as far as uh, what it was. If um, on the other hand, when you do something like metagenomics, so you're taking um, a large sample of, say, an environmental sample and grinding it up uh, to make basically a smoothie out of it and then trying to do barcoding. Then, for example, in um, three places down off the uh, coast of Florida, we had, I think, 1,700 uh, unknown taxa. So that's why getting barcode data, which maybe you could say just a light skim of a genome um, across the tree of life will enable you to approximately identify things like get it to family or maybe to genus. But let's remember that um, at least 90% of life on Earth doesn't have a name. It's never been described. So um, working at these deeper taxonomic levels is one way to get what I call you know, sort of mesoscale IDs for things like cryptic species. Great. So you mentioned some of the collection projects that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, funding opportunities that might be available for collections, and what's the scope that you all are, are using for those? Um, well, it's, it's a it's a six-year program, and it is, uh, it's actually private donors who are supporting this uh, who you know, give the money to the Smithsonian. So we, our scope is that we would like to see a Smithsonian co-PI on a grant proposal. Um, and um, we do two things. Like GGI is also funding about eight genomes um, so far anyway. But, if we were to focus on doing genomes, um, we would have no money left. It's the, the, the idea here is about it's a, a $15 million program of which we've raised, and we're in year three now. So uh, we tend to favor, um, if it's preservation is sort of the fork in the program that, that you're talking about, we tend to favor collecting programs that um, will get a diversity of things. So we don't, we don't fund someone to go to Southeast Asia and catch one mammal, for example. We fund them to go to Southeast Asia and catch lots of mammals. Um, but uh, we have about 160 projects going now. Um, and uh, the other way we do this is by finding biorepositories or databases around the world, and then we partner specifically with them to bring them online. Like for example, there's a big um, uh, barcode center in Guelph, uh, which I assume everybody's heard of. And uh, we're partnering with them and funding them to bring their database online, which should increase the number of samples on GGBAN by about a million uh, by June of 18. So hope that's not too long an answer. Yeah. So I've got a, another question here. Do you uh, collect and store extracted DNA or RNA, or do you only store the specimens? Uh, all three. Okay. So uh, for small organisms, the genomic sample actually usually is the organism. Um, and you know, for small spiders, um, you're still, you know, you're, you essentially um, extract all the DNA out of the specimen. But uh, that's the, although the answer to that, it's, it's always research driven. So sometimes the vouchers will end up, say, you know, at some other institution, like say the uh, University of Florida might in their museum, and we might have the DNAs and um, or RNAs, or uh, and it goes all the way out towards uh, viable cell cultures as well. So uh, we'll take anything that um, you know that looks like it might be useful in the future. Great. Does anybody, I, I don't want to cut anybody off that got an open mic. Does anybody want to ask that, or I can ask some more of the questions that have been sent in? I guess I'll continue on the ones that I've got here in text. Um, 
what preservation method have you found to, that works best for collection and storage of specimens in order to preserve the high molecular weight DNA for, for later extraction? Are, are you preferencing, I, I think the idea here is, are you preferencing a freezing approach or maybe uh, saving within paraffin or, uh, or some other means? Well, I think uh, that's an active area of research, um, and uh, that paper I described um, greater than 9 kb, wherever the hell, this thing here, um, we worked on fishes and crustacea particularly there, and the, uh, the answers were different for both groups. So DMSO is a buffer that um, penetrates very well into tissue, so if you're doing something like vertebrates, where you actually have muscle tissue, it penetrates directly into the tissue and um, is a pretty good uh, preservative. Uh, ethanol, on the other hand, is superior for things with exoskeletons, probably because DMSO doesn't cross uh, arthropod cuticle very well. However, the most interesting thing that we found was that um, Plunging live animals into liquid nitrogen was actually apparently inferior to treating the tissue or the animal, which with whatever buffer you're using, prior to freezing. And we think that's because um, the DNA is high molecular weight when it goes into the liquid nitrogen, but when you take it out and leave it on your desk, say for three minutes or something like that, the internal structure of the cell has been essentially disrupted, and all the DNA ases are sort of loose in cell sap and degrade the DNA um, on that first thaw cycle. So, uh, but we're collaborating with an institution in, in uh, Germany to do a three-year experiment over four or five different ways of preserving um, DNA. So it's an active area of research. but. You yeah. are happy to take collections in alcohol, then? Well, yeah, as particularly if, they, if they're frozen um, soon after. So, so I you would don't want it to have sat in al alcohol for uh, years, <laughs> then? Yeah, at room temperature? Yeah. Um, no. You know, a, a lot of what we actually fund in terms of research is actually bait capture techniques for building trees. I mean, that's because we're a bunch of systematists over here. That's what we do. But um, yeah, you know, it's, it's different across the different clades of organisms. Um, I've got one guy who wants to go collect amblypigeons pig in the Atlantic forest of Brazil, and uh, he's just not going to get you know, liquid nitrogen in the Atlantic Forest of Brazil. So you have to work with people. Uh, we've also funded a number of USDA scientists who work here in the building. They went to Argentina. They did get some liquid nitrogen down there. So I would say in terms of expeditions, it's um, we work with whoever is doing it and what's feasible. Okay. And I guess this is, this is related to what you've been saying. Uh, have the groups you work with found any DNA DNA extraction methods that seem to universally work well for high molecular weight DNA, uh, regardless of chitin, fat body, or other tissue source challenges. Um, no, I don't. I don't think we have. Uh, it's. Um, I think that's still a question in the in the primary literature. And um, what is interesting, though, is that very few publications measure the uh, molecular weight of whole genomic DNA. It's uh, usually been the case that people are PCRing a particular, you know, marker out and they're measuring, you know, the, the efficiency with which they've done something like that. So um, very few people are sort of measuring um, the quality of whole genomic DNA. That's why I mentioned pulse steel gel electrophoresis is probably good to do measuring about 50 kb. Um, and uh, I know that when you the the people who are doing the best genomics is probably the G10K folks. They want phase chromosome level assemblies with up to 500 kb reads. So when you start talking about 500 kb fragments, I think it's it's really a wide open field. I'm not sure anyone really knows how to reliably get DNA of that quality. And certainly there's nothing that's universal that I know of. Great. 
Yeah, I think it sounds like that is that's going to continue being the challenge within our zirpods is, is depending on the, the species is, is what method is going to work and, and sort of having at least a short list that we can, can work with um, for, for people who are experiencing those challenges. So yeah, well, certainly the first thing we need to do is to agree how we're going to measure it. Uh, yes. Is it going to be gel, you know, pulse field gel electrophoresis? There's, uh, you know, um, it's hard. Right. Yeah. And of course, arthropods don't contain much DNA, so the the G10K people are, it's a pack bio plus bio nano plus 10x genomics, and pack bio needs an awful lot of DNA, so it's not really feasible for small arthropods. Unless you're going to mix, you know, individuals, and then you get into heterozygosity, and it's it becomes problematic. Yeah, because they, I I believe their standards is often to do a phase to genome approach, and so you won't you that that you throw that out if you're going to mix um, samples. Yeah. Um, so what's the best way for somebody who's on this call that has a freezer full of specimens uh, and wants to transfer those to you all uh, and put them into a GGBN repository? How, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, it's a, are they in the United States? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you can certainly just email me, um, and uh, I'll certainly respond. The, um, it usually comes, I tell you, the, we are taking, uh, just to give you one anecdote, there was a, a Scripps Oceanographic uh, about 30 years ago, the U.S. government sent a bunch of ships around the world to do uh, samples of, of deep sea rift fauna, which uh, will never happen again. And this guy is now retired, and um, about 30,000 uh, samples of rift fauna. So we do, we, we are very interested in getting uh, these high quality sort of never to be repeated um, collections of, of samples. And we don't care where they go. They don't have to come to the Smithsonian has the capacity, but it could be in any GGBN institution. Um. Great. And so, yeah, I think the challenge is just getting that, that effort organized then to, to transfer them to you. So, um. mm -hmm. It's usually the metadata that's the hard part. It's the, um, the spreadsheet that goes along with it. But. Yeah, and and you because you're wanting frozen, you you don't the pin specimens. I believe the the repositories that are there for those are, are where you'd rather see at this point those pin specimens. Well, things. yeah, I mean uh, we are very eager to make sure that the the tissue samples are properly vouchered. Of course, there are some things like say whales where you cannot get a voucher, right? It's, it's uh, but um, those for at yeah, the Smithsonian, they would go into our regular museum collections. So, and, you know, we're we're not talking about that much stuff, really. I mean, it's uh, we have 145 million specimens. So, and you know, at a minimum, uh, GGI is talking about say 100,000. So, it's it's not actually that large a project. Uh, so given the numerous options available when you're working with arthropods, what's the preferred sex, life stage, or tissue that you all lo are looking for for preservation? Well, if it's not a colonial organism like, say, an ant or a bee, um, you want you know, an adult that is uh, the more identifiable taxonomic sex, which is often males. Um, however, you know, in my own work with small spiders, you know, you might catch, say, 10 individuals, and you think they're all the same species, um, but then you don't actually know. So uh, what we've done in those cases is we'll, we'll freeze nine of them in liquid nitrogen, put one in, say, 95%, pull a leg off, uh, one in the frozen series and one in the alcohol series, and then barcode both of those and use the CO1 sequence to confirm that you the, the nine are actually conspecific with the tenth, if that makes sense. So um, hope that answers that. All right. Um, it was, uh, again, I just want to leave it the, the line open here. Does anybody have a verbal question that they want to ask?
I guess, well, let's see. But there's a couple more questions. Is um, I think you mentioned a little bit about this effort. Is there more research being done to compare the genomes um, that are in the collection from from fresh collections and those that were collected in the past um, to kind of understand degradation and, and that sampling effort? Uh, no, I don't think there have been very many publications that actually address it at a genomic level. There have been plenty. You know, barcoding started in 2003 with Paul Hebert, and there have been plenty of uh, studies talking about PCR to 18S, ribosomal genes, CO1. Uh, but at the level of genomes, no, I don't think so. And I think we also have to remember that um, science is sequencing Neanderthals. So uh, although um, we really want high molecular weight DNA going forward, we also have to remember that if you have enough money, you can, you can sequence highly degraded genomes. Of course, it helps to have a reference genome you know, next to it, which you do for Neanderthals. But um, even degraded DNA, if it's, um, you know, it's a cost-benefit thing, right? It's what is it DNA of? Are we ever going to get any more? And uh, then we'll take the degraded stuff. Otherwise, you'd rather have something that's high quality and vouchered. Have you all considered working with the journals to uh, establish some standards for, for vouchering and, and depositing these sort of samples into, uh, into GGB and repositories? Uh, just as the genomic sequence has to be deposited into an INSDC repository? Yeah. We've certainly taught, thought about it and talked to, um, to various publishers about it, uh, but not in any, I'd say, business-like way. But the, we, basically, we just get stiff arms. They, they, um, remember, GGBN really started in 2011, 2013, so it's a very young organization. Um, and uh, its next international meeting, by the way, is next year in Vienna. But um, we don't have enough clout to make journals do um, what we want, I don't think. Hopefully, hopefully that is gaining some ground, Will. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you guys have some bioinformaticians on staff and that you also yeah. um, are looking for people to be uh, co-leads on projects. How open are those uh, groups for consultation on projects? It, it sounds like you all have a lot of knowledge in terms of uh, the, the best ways to go about some of these projects. How would people access um, them and, and set up a consultation? Um. Well, you can you can email me or Katie. I mean, GGI has a website, so you can you can find out um, you know more about accessing things there. Um, we have the Smithsonian has four bioinformaticians, PhD bioinformaticians, and a high performance computing um, cluster. So um, the bioinformaticians. I have one PhD bioinformatician who works for me. And uh, she's working on eight genomes. Um, and uh, of course, there are other scientists here. But, I mean, not just me, right? But um, that would be um, are doing genomics. Sean Brady does a lot of genomics in Hymenoptera. Torsten Dykow does uh, Diptera. Um, I do arachnids. Hannah Wood does arachnids. So there's a couple of people here. I mean, part of the reason for having an SI um, co-PI is we want to have someone that we can uh, bug if we give them the money and they don't give us the goods. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what about um, bridging the gap between uh, that, those INSDC uh, archives like NCBI and GGBN? Is there linking between those? Uh, Absolutely. How, what's the, what's the, how are we bridging the gap to make sure that those assembled genomes and transcriptomes are accessible to the public? Um, well, Assembled genomes and transcriptomes, that's a, that's a, a, a GenBank or a EMBL sort of thing. And yeah, I am talking to Eileen Misraki, who's the head of, the, uh, head of uh, GenBank. And um, our, basically our technical database shop is in Berlin at the Berlin Botanical Garden. And we're linking out to uh, GBIF. We don't, we don't duplicate anybody's data, but if uh, if there's a number on a GGBN sample that is accessible in GenBank, we'll find the link. 
and uh, so you can sort of machine reason across the whole thing. But GGBN is really targeted at this missing link because we have GenBank that does sequences, we have Darwin Core Archives and, and GBIF which does specimens and localities, but until GGBN, no one had ever formalized a database for tissues and DNA, and that's that's what GGBN's specialty is. Yeah, and we do look at each other. That metadata is definitely hard to establish, and I noticed that you all have a call out right now um, asking for feedback from the community on, on some of those metadata standards that you're setting Yeah, up. and they evolve. Uh, so we, we're also, a portion of that metadata has to do with permitting. So I mean, that's why I asked if someone has tissues in another country. Um, the United States, of course, is not a signatory to the CBD, but um, essentially all institutions in the United States act as if they were. So permitting is uh, a gnarly issue, no doubt about it. So for somebody who wants to access um, a specimen that you might have in the biorepository, mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned you've got a lot of two-mil tubes. What is the process for granting them access and how much material are they able to access? Well, it depends on what's in the tube, and um, but you know we are a publicly funded institution, and our job is to provide uh, loans of things to um, you know for any scientific purpose. Uh, I would say I think that GGBN and GGI is staying away from uh, commercialization of things. So if it was a corporation or something like that, I guess there'd be we'd want to know about um, benefit sharing with the original collectors and things like that. But no, that's what we do. So um, the, the loans depend on what group of organisms it is. If you're talking about arthropods, then it's going to be someone in the entomology department and, uh, that handles things like that. But yeah, we provide, we provide um, we'll loan any of it. Well, we will make decisions about loaning any of it, but in principle, that's what we're in the business of doing. I was going to say, because uh, the, in terms of uh, an arthropod, it's very likely that uh, you wouldn't actually be alone. In, in order to sequence, you would probably lose that specimen. Yeah, I, I didn't know if you sampling. have any requirements and that, that something comes mm -hmm. with that project. Yeah, they're more, they're more developed on the sorts of the parts of the tree where this is more likely to happen, such as invertebrates. So there's destructive sampling requests for mammals and birds and herps and fishes. There's whole sort of PDFs on our websites that deal with things like that. Um, same thing's true for uh, plants and uh, in arthropods, uh, we consider it. I mean, there would be a dialogue back and forth about what do you want to do and, um, you know, how likely you're going to be able to do it. But um, um, in principle, all of these collections are there for, uh, to serve research science. Great. Well, we're getting to the end of the hour. If there's any other questions uh, verbally, please just go ahead and, and uh, speak up. Um, but I want to thank you. This has been a really wonderful introduction to both GGI and GGBN and understanding uh, these resources and how we all can, can contribute back and, and uh, mm -hmm. build this resource as well. I think that would be a great thing to do as, as we're talking about the Earth Biogenomes Project and uh, some of these future sequencing efforts. If we don't have the material, we certainly can't start the project. So uh, I think this would be a great goal for everybody to make sure that these um, vouchers are, are being deposited and are, are being made available to the community so that when we all retire, uh, something, is, something is left behind. So, um, so I, wanna, I really want to thank you for, for your time and, and your talk. And uh, we'll have, uh, the plan is to have another webinar next month. Um, and so I will see you all then. Thank you and have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.